So, welcome to Maxwell's electromagnetic theory. It's based on four equations. They're called Maxwell's equations. Four equations. And the first thing that he did, you know, he just modified Ampere's law. Does anybody remember Ampere's law? We just finished that. Yeah, closed line integral B dot DL is equal to mu naught times the current enclosed by the path, mu naught I. That is Ampere's law. And the modification was, you know, this is the only change that Maxwell made. Everything else was already there, and he just took it. And why did he make this change? Uh, to account for the magnetic field due to a charging or discharging capacitor. After it comes through, I'll explain it. If you have a capacitor either charging up or discharging, stop right there. If you have a capacitor that is discharging, tell me this, is the electric field changing? You have a discharging capacitor. Is the electric field changing? <laughs> yes or no? Or maybe it's charging. Is the electric field between the plates changing? <laughs> yes, it is changing. Uh, we already know that a changing magnetic field can produce an electric field. I hope you know that. That is Faraday's <coughs> law of electromagnetic induction, a changing magnetic field. So Maxwell argues that if a changing magnetic field can produce an electric field, then a changing electric field should also produce a magnetic field. You see that? That's the argument. And therefore, he introduces a second term in Ampere's law. What's Ampere's law? Close line integral B dot DL is equal to mu naught I is already there. He says plus to account for the changing electric field. So that's what you're going to see. So this is how he modified it. And as I said, that involves the changing electric field. <coughs> now, to get that equation is a little bit easy than you think. Q is C times voltage, isn't it? And what's capacitance? Capacitance, the formula is, come on, sure. epsilon naught A by D. Yeah. And you know that voltage can be written as intensity times distance, two substitutions, simple substitutions. This is for capacitance, that's for this. Cancel out the Ds, you get that. And I is dQ by dt. So you take the differential of this with respect to time, and you're going to get these two are constants, so it's dE by dt. Isn't it? Epsilon naught A D by D D. What is A D by D D? If you multiply the intensity with the area, you get the flux. E times A is the flux. So therefore, A D by D D gives you D phi E by D D. That's the new term that Maxwell brought in. So epsilon naught D phi E by D D is the new term. And with the addition of that term, Ampere's law, as modified by Maxwell, becomes closed line integral B dot D L is equal to mu naught I enclosed, which is already there, plus that term. I hope you got it. Now, how does this show? What's this? What's this term? Isn't this the change in electric field with time? The change in electric field with time? can also produce a magnetic field. Read it like that. A current can produce a magnetic field, we know that, but a changing electric field can also produce a magnetic field. So there are two components. Okay? Now I'm going to list Maxwell's four equations, and they should be very familiar. I've not written the names of the equations, so I want to check whether you can remember those. This is the first equation. 
closed integral e dot d a is equal to q epsilon naught. Any idea? Gauss's law in what? Electricity or magnetism? Electricity. The total flux passing through a closed surface, a Gaussian surface, is equal to 1 by epsilon naught times the charge enclosed by that surface. That's Gauss law in electricity. OK, now, let me give you an, a chance. How would the Gauss law in magnetism look like? Um, what's the difference between electricity and magnetism? I've, you know. I've explained this many times. Well, the constants are all different, but one big difference is that in magnetism, there are no monopoles. Remember that? Lines start from a north pole and do not end on a south pole. They go back. So when you talk about flux passing out of a closed surface, it doesn't exist. Because whatever passes out comes back in. Because they return. Is that clear enough? Therefore, the Gauss's law in magnetism would look similar, but except that it would be equated to zero. Because there's no flux passing out. Therefore, closed integral b dot dA instead of v dot dA would be zero. It's as simple as that. And I explained it. Because there's really no magnetic field passing out. Because as much as going out, it's coming back in. So that's Maxwell's thinking. He says, well, this is the Gauss law in magnetism. Number three, you have seen this also. And very recently. E dot dL is equal to minus d phi b by dt. Any idea? Induced EMF. This is Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction, which we just finished. The rate, you see Lenz's law also incorporated there, because the negative shows you that it's opposite to whatever is causing it. So that's Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. And finally, Ampere's law that we just discussed with the modification. These are Maxwell's four equations. Is that the modification? Mu naught epsilon naught d phi <coughs> e by dt? Maxwell's equations, and I hope you understood all the four equations. How do you produce electromagnetic waves is the idea now. A picture of the electromagnetic wave. A beautiful picture. Look at that. It's uh, the electric vector given by the red one and the magnetic given by the blue one as before. Okay? And they are both perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So if the direction of propagation is along the x-axis, as shown in the figure, the electromagnetic wave is going along the x-axis, then at any one instant, the electric vector, I'm talking about the first part, the electric vector is along the y-axis and the magnetic is along the z-axis, easily understood, right? But they're not fixed forever. As they move forward, they are both rotating. You get that? Mm -hmm. But whatever and wherever they rotate, the angle between them will always be 90 degrees, is what you take away from that picture. So the electric and the magnetic vector are always at 90 degrees to each other. They're they are not fixed. They're rotating about the direction of propagation as an axis. Are you getting it? Yes. And on top of that, their magnitudes are changing. Can you make out that their magnitudes are changing? Are they in phase with each other? Yes, they are in phase with each other. Look at when they both become zero exactly at the same time. I'm talking about... A point like this, both became zero exactly at the same point, right? They are in phase with each other, and they both become maximum at the same time, and they're rotating. This is a concept of an electromagnetic wave. All right, so I have listed it down. Number one, the electric mag magnetic fields are perpendicular to each other and to the direction of travel. They are at right angles to each other and also at right angles to the direction of travel. Number two, I might have said they are in phase. Uh, it's 
can't remember the order in which I said it. The electric and magnetic fields okay, are in phase with each other. They become zero and they become maximum at the same time. They are in phase. And number three, as I said, the fields rotate about <coughs> the direction of propagation as the axis. Three ideas about the electromagnetic wave. And you know, uh, this number one can be found out using the right hand rule. Remember the right-hand rule still? But this is how it should be modified. First along the electric field, then along the magnetic. This gives you the direction of propagation. Finished. E, B, direction of propagation. Make sense? E, electric field, magnetic field, direction of propagation. So the right-hand rule can be applied even in this case. Interested, you can look at the derivation, but he related it to Mr. up there. C is the symbol for speed of electromagnetic waves. It's 1 by square root mu naught times epsilon naught. What's mu naught? The permeability of free space. That's a magnetic property, isn't it? What's epsilon naught? Permittivity of free space, which is an electrical property. So in his mathematical derivations, if at all there's something in math that I so much love and appreciate, it's how Maxwell got this formula. It's in your textbook. Try to take some time and see how he got it. Not that tough. We are hard pressed for time. That's why I'm not going there. Finally, he got C is 1 by root mu naught epsilon naught. And when you substitute the values, you know, epsilon naught is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12, right? And mu naught is 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7. Plug it in. You will get exactly 3 times 10 to the 8 meter per second. That is the velocity of all electromagnetic waves. When you get time, try to plug those numbers in and you get 3 times 10 to the 8. So that's why we use the speed of light or speed of electromagnetic waves as 3 times 10 to the 8 meter per second. Nobody, in fact, has got this number experimentally. Because if you look at this number, it's really big. It's 300,000 kilometers in one second. 186,000 miles in a second is not a joke. And to be able to find that out in a lab uh, looks like crazy to us, but scientists never give up. So they did succeed. The first one was Foucault, who got it like, I can't remember the exact numbers, who got it like 2.9 times 10 to the 8 meter per second with a rotating plane mirror. He used a rotating plane mirror. Then came Michelson, and that's given in your textbook, Michelson used an eight-sided rotating mirror. What's important is he had two concave mirrors. One kept on Mount Wilson, uh, I can't, and the other kept on Mount Baldy, both in Texas. Have you ever heard of these? These mountains are 35 kilometers apart. He placed two huge concave mirrors on these two mountains and set up his lab on one of those mountains, where he had the a rotating eight-sided mirror close to another concave mirror, to close to the, the, maybe the first concave mirror. Are you with me? Use the tiny source of light and using the rotating mirror. His idea was that light would hit one side of the octagonal mirror. Watch me, you get it. One side of the octagonal mirror, go back, fall on the concave mirror, number one, and go all the way to the second concave mirror. And then there's a plane mirror kept at the focus of this concave mirror. It falls in the head back to the concave mirror, and all the way back to concave mirror one, and by the time it returns, if, if the light had originally hit this face, and this face was here at that time, it would hit the next face. That means the mirror had made one by eighth of a rotation. You see the idea by which the scientist tackles the high speed of light. You see that? And this octagonal mirror was rotating, even to do, do that, it was rotating so fast, that the sides of the octagonal mirror got chipped off due to the rotation. And then he had to use a 12-sided mirror to ultimately get 2.98 times 10 to the 8 meter per second. Well, scientists were happy. They are not satisfied yet. And finally, again, cutting a long story short, there is a scientist who 
found a method called an idea, a phenomenon called the Kerr effect, K-E-R-R. -R. He used that effect to build what's called a Kerr cell. And using the Kerr cell, you can find the speed of light, electromagnetic waves, in the lab on a table. You get it as 2.99 times 10 to the 8 meter per second. Well, physics is interesting. Somebody gets it theoretically, a massive value, without any doubt, that's correct. That's theoretical calculation. And then somebody else goes on to prove that we're getting closer and closer and closer to that. Isn't this something to think about? Yes, it is. So, like I said, they are based on the frequencies. And gamma rays having the highest frequency have the highest energy. That's why they can pierce the genes, the chromosomes, and cause mutations. We're still having the effects of... Uh, the atom bombs dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, long time after it had been dropped, and that's why we are worried about other countries getting the bomb. Because of having seen how they can cause mutations, and people, children are still born with two heads and six fingers, fungus growing on their backs, and all kinds of genetic mutations. You scrape it off, it goes back. So that's what can happen because of X, um, gamma rays. And X-rays are just close by that, isn't it? Now, we use X-rays to detect foreign bodies in the human body. But remember that overdue exposure to X-rays can cause harm. The old CRT television picture tubes would produce a certain amount of X-rays. And that's why you were asked not to sit very close to the television set. But children never understood about X-rays. And they would always sit close. Thank goodness that LCDs and plasma and all that have taken that out of the scene. But... That's after many people had bad, you know, how, how do you call it? Affectations, if that's a word. <laughs> okay. Affected badly because of those x-rays. And so on. <clears throat> Excuse me. We don't realize many things. I want to finish this off. Okay, so you see that, that the visible wavelength is from 4,000 angstrom units, which is 400 nanometer, to 750 nanometer. That's all. Look at that tiny part. Just focus your attention on this, on this tiny part that you can see. That's the only part we can see. We cannot see above. We cannot see below. That's the only part we can see. But all these rays are here for sure. And they can be detected by other means. So that's the electromagnetic spectrum. Let me see what I wrote there. OK, very important thing. There's a scientist called Ponting, P-O-Y-N-T-I-N-G, who calculates the energy transported per unit time per unit area. Energy transported by electromagnetic waves every second in one meter squared. And he and this is actually called the Ponting vector. So remember that definition. Energy per second per meter squared. It is called the Ponting vector, represented by S. And we can derive that S is equal to a cross product, 1 by mu naught E cross B. 1 by mu naught E cross B. Did that make any sense? You know what E and B are, right? The electric vector, the magnetic vector, and mu naught coming in. So that's the ponting vector. You could be asked to work out a problem using this, of course. And remember that E can be given as... 3i plus 4j plus 2k, you know what I mean. And b can be given like that, and you know how to take the cross product. Right? Because you might be asked, that could be one of the questions in the exam. That's 1 by mu naught, not m naught. Okay. We had we gone through this before. 1 by mu naught e cross b, that's the ponting vector. Now we'll get to wireless communication. How is radio, TV, Communication possible. <coughs> All right. You cannot build a radio with this. This is called a block diagram. That means each block represents tens of hundreds of components. But at the basic level, you study it as blocks. Just like if you study San Jack, you would say there are so many rooms, but Yet in those rooms, there are human beings. And if you were to study the human beings and, you know what I'm trying to say, the systems, that would be detailed electronic engineering. But right now, we just study, all right, these are the rooms in San Jack. So that's the block diagram. 
First of all, if I sing, well, nobody will listen to it, but anyway. Okay, <laughs> if I sing, these sound waves will not go too far. So you have to convert it into an electrical signal using a microphone. Everybody knows. A microphone converts an audio signal into an electrical signal. But just think about the energy in an audio signal. It will be so small that the current would be of the order of microamperes. And that cannot go too far either. Therefore, you need to empower it. You need to amplify it. So the first thing that you see is called AF amplifier. It stands for audio frequency amplifier. That means it amplifies frequencies between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. Isn't that what I produce? Every human being produces? So that is an audio frequency amplifier. But audio frequency, remember, energy depends on the frequency. And audio frequencies can only go up to 20,000 hertz, right? And that barely happens. It's normally around 10,000 hertz, and that's less energy. So now is the important point. You cannot transport this as it is, even though you've amplified it. So you need to carry it on a high-frequency wave. Because higher the frequency, bigger the energy. So you require a carrier wave. And this carrier wave is produced using an electrical oscillator. Anybody remembers what an electrical oscillator is? It produces frequencies F is equal to 1 by 2 pi root LC. Electrical oscillator is simply an inductor and a capacitor connected in parallel to each other. Right? So you need to carry this audio signal on a high frequency carrier wave. But how do you carry? It's not like a mom carrying a child. You need to mix them together. And this process of mixing them together is called modulation. M-O-D-U-L-A-T-I-O-N. Modulation is the process of mixing the audio signal with the carrier. And the mixing can be done in three ways. We'll come to that shortly. But look at that. The blue and the green shows you the mixer. And below that, you see the RF oscillator, don't you? So you have the radio frequency, because that's high frequency, radio frequency oscillator producing the carrier waves, the audio signal that's being generated by the microphone, both being mixed together in the mixer. Let me remind you that all these are complicated electronic devices, okay? Just we study it as blocks. And once you get that modulated signal, you've got to take that to an RF amplifier, a radio frequency amplifier, because now it's radio frequency, basically. You increase the frequency, increase the energy, and then it goes on to the transmitting antenna, and it's thrown out into space. And these waves go out, and you, will, you have a radio which has an antenna, which picks up these feeble waves, and then inside the radio, you have to demodulate, because you do not need the carrier. The purpose of the carrier is finished. You need the signal, which is the audio content, isn't it? Now, that process is called demodulation. Now, before you demodulate, you have to amplify it. Once you get into the antenna, amplify it, demodulate it, amplify it again, and give it to the speaker. I hope you understood. And you hear that lovely voice, if it was not me singing. Okay. Clear? And each radio station, I told you the other day, I think somebody, Matt asked a question. I said, each radio station has a particular frequency. And we, I, I'm just giving you the allotted carrier frequencies. You need not by heart it, but it's good to know. Internationally, carrier frequencies, 530 kilohertz to 1760s is for amplitude modulation in a radio. 1700 kilohertz, amplitude modulation in a radio. That's kilohertz, remember. That's called AM, amplitude modulation. Come to that in a second. FM radio uses 88 to, you know that, right? You listen to FM most of the time, 88 to 108. And then for TV, there are different bands. That's why you call it the C band and S band and all that. Ever heard about that? Different bands are a lot. 54 to 72, 76 to 88, 174 to 216, and 470 to 698. All in megahertz. All these are megahertz. That's what's allotted for TV. So those are the permitted Carrier frequencies. I hope you understood that is the carrier frequency. Okay. I think I'm talking about uh, demodulation uh, you know, right now and then. What does FM stand for? 
look at amplitude modulation. Simple. Let's keep it simple because physics is simple. What do you have on top is an audio signal, like somebody sang a real neat, ah, you know. It's not like that you sing all the time, ah, you get, wait, you know what I mean. So that's like a regular rhythmic sound made. That's the program, that's the audio. And that has a less frequency, as you can see, and the lower one is the carrier, which has a higher frequency. Smaller wavelength, higher frequency. Are you with me? And in amplitude modulation, you change the amplitude of the carrier according to the amplitude of the signal, period. You change the amplitude. Remember the carrier had a constant amplitude? Are you watching that? Constant amplitude. Now you change the amplitude of the carrier according to the amplitude of the signal. So whenever the signal becomes zero, the amplitude of the carrier should become zero. That's what you see in this wave that is shown here. When I said zero, you must understand that if you look at, let me just pick one point, try to explain that quickly. If you just take one point, you know that the zero of the program should be somewhere here. Anybody with me? Isn't that the zero? If you draw a vertical line straight down, you will, see, if I was drawing it correctly, you will see that the amplitude at this point, this point, should be exactly the original <coughs> amplitude, means there is no change. Why? Because the amplitude of the signal at that point was what? Zero. So whenever the amplitude became maximum positive, like here, I can't even do here now, maximum positive, that's where you find maximum change. Is anybody trying to, are you trying to get it? So, so that's amplitude modulation. Actually, in amplitude modulation, you can cut this into two halves because both the halves are symmetrical. It's actually called single sideband transmission. Two sidebands and all that study. Read about that if you have the time and the purpose. So this is amplitude modulation. Amplitude of carrier varies in proportion to the audio amplitude. That's all you need to know. Okay. Now that takes us to frequency modulation. How do you define this? Like this. The frequency of the carrier changes according to the amplitude of the signal. That's all. What changes? The frequency of the carrier. Remember the carrier had constant frequencies in it? Now you see that they're going to bunch up in some places and be pulled away at some other places, if you watch carefully. Do you? Do you see it? You must. If you're awake and alive, you must be able to see that. So at this point, you see that there's no change. Why? Because that corresponds to the zero of the signal, isn't it? They bunch up where it's positive maximum and they are pulled apart where the signal is going through the negative maximum. Anybody with me? That's frequency modulation. You change the frequency of the carrier. We need not talk about uh, phase modulation. Actually, the phase of the carrier is changed according to the amplitude of the signal. We don't need that. Okay, now radio reception or radio receiver. I already told you this. First we talked about radio transmitter, now radio receiver. Did I tell you about this? You have the receiving antenna and you have RF tuner. Oh, do you remember the tuner? What's a tuner? Yeah, it's variable capacitor, right? So you tune in different frequencies and you get that and then you have the RF signal which is demodulated. What's demodulation? Separating the audio from the carrier. You separate it. You only have the audio now and you have an AF amplifier and then onto the loudspeaker and you listen to that crazy song and you dance to the tune. Okay, so that is radio broadcasting. <laughs> now, this is our tuning circuit, which I just put back there. You remember that? Somebody might say, but there's no resistance here. Remember that? There's always a resistance in a circuit, which gets added up to this. And for your information, this is a transistor. Transistor? Have heard of a transistor? We've all heard about sisters, but transistor... 1947, Christmas Eve, three scientists, Shockley, Bretain, and Bardeen. Three scientists created a transistor, and you must see the photographs of the original transistor. They are huge. You must read this. This is what created a revolution in electronics. Simple idea of a transistor, where they took 
semiconductors, made it n-type, p-type, and all that, and sandwiched a p-type between two n-types, and you had a transistor, and then from there we progressed into integrated circuits, where you have millions of transistors on a chip, you know what I'm talking about, and then a processor, and so on and so forth. So this is real. This is not a dream. We're not in a dream. <coughs> so if you can do a lot of stuff using those tiny devices in your hands, remember to thank all the scientists who did all this. And, you know, that's why we're enjoying the world like we are. And that brings us to the end of today's lecture. Right on time. Thank you.